This is VLX number 58, Jesus Heals a Mute, Matthew chapter 9, verses 32 to 34. God give you his peace, and nomine patris et fidi, spiritu sancti, amen. God our Lord, we ask the grace that all of our intentions, actions, and operations be directed purely to the service and praise of your divine majesty. In nomine patris et fidi, spiritu sancti, amen. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who is mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the prince of demons. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. Okay, so today we obviously have someone who cannot talk, and Jesus miraculously opens his ears and his mouth. Now the English says, a demon-oppressed man who is mute, maybe because they don't like to associate mute with demon-oppressed that closely, but the Greek, a little bit scarier, scarier here, the Greek says kophon diamonizomenon, which is literally demonized deaf or demonized mute. It's a, almost a hyphenated word that the deafness is that close to the demons. Or maybe better, we could say deaf by possession or mute by diabolical possession. Now, of course, Deaf and mute are usually one in the same sense to speak. You usually have to hear. If you're profoundly deaf, you will eventually lose a good chunk of your ability to speak. If you were born deaf, you'll never speak without either a miracle or one other thing we're going to discuss later. But first we have to ask, did all the ancients really think that every deaf person had a demon? In the 1970s, a lot of these Catholic scripture scholars said, oh, all the people in the past were really stupid. They thought every disease came from a demon. Well, that's just not true. Let's listen to what Father Lapide said in the year 1600. Father Lapide begins by quoting Matthew chapter 9, verse 33. And after the devil was cast out by Christ's command, the dumb man spoke. Father Lapide then continues, From this it appears that the demon had made a man deaf and dumb, who is not so naturally, by hindering the use of his tongue and ears, so that when he was cast out, the dumb man immediately heard and spoke. Thus says St. John Chrysostom. Okay, so that right there is really important. We have to make this delineation between being deaf by a natural cause and being deaf by a demon. Even in the 16th century, they were able to delineate between that. So we can assume in the first century, they understood the difference very well there. Now look, I would be the last person in the world to say all deafness is due to a demon because my five-year-old niece is deaf. Okay, so where does this lead to the Bible passage today? Well, let's connect deaf and mute. It's like I said earlier, deaf people can't talk. Probably today's man in Matthew chapter 9, he lost his hearing later in life since we know it was due to a diabolical possession, not from natural causes. And even though my niece losing her hearing in utero probably had nothing to do with the demon, deafness is usually tantamount to muteness unless you get a miracle like Matthew 9 or a huge surgery like my niece did. And of course, muteness is the inability to speak, whether this be due to preternatural causes or natural causes. Now, in the Bible today, it's entirely due to a demon. And again, yes, the ancients could differentiate between a pathophysiology that was natural, like CMV, even though they didn't have the term CMV, or preternatural, like this demon-possessed deaf man. So this leads to the question of the day. Why would a demon make someone mute who could speak and hear for most of his life before that? This is just my suspicion. This isn't the Church Fathers, but here it is. As you know, we are made in God's image and likeness. Satan cannot attack the face of God, so he tries to attack our faces. Jesus is the one word, capital W word, the eternal word spoken by the Father. Satan cannot stop that. But he does want to stop that which is made in God's image and likeness from speaking. God the Father speaks God the Son in eternity, and we can only speak limited words in time. But communicating to others our own intellect and will is one of our greatest theological proofs that we are made in God's image and likeness. And since demons will be locked away in hell forever at one point, they are jealous that we can speak the truth in love now. And they want to stop us now. Satan wants to cover our faces and make it impossible for us to communicate. Satan wants to mask us and mute us. 
That is why it's such an extraordinary exorcism today when Jesus kicks this demon out and immediately the man can speak. Jesus takes away this diabolical, tamponating mask away, spiritually that is, of course, and reveals under this a son of God made in his own image and likeness. Imagine this guy going from pursed lips, maybe even a clenched jaw, from this demon keeping his mouth closed permanently and even his ears, to then hearing and speaking. Instantaneously, this man in Matthew chapter 9 can hear and speak. And this is why the crowd is so astonished. We heard today, as they were going away, behold, a demon oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. So what are the reactions? Well, on the good side, we have a manifestation or an epiphany of light. The crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. That word seen in the Greek is different from the normal verb to see in Greek. Today it is ephane. Ephane comes from that word phos, where we get words of light in English like photon. It's also the same root word as epiphany, meaning manifestation. So put all this together and loosely we could say this crowd is exulting in an epiphany of light and sound in this miracle. And up to this point, Remember, the Pharisees had kind of tried to fit in with the crowd on their opinion on Jesus. Maybe, maybe tried to sway him a little bit behind the scenes away from him. But now, today, they fully reveal their colors on him by executing a total blasphemy against our Lord. They cannot deny the miracle they just saw, so they deny the source of the miracle. You see, they don't want to say it's from God, so get this. They say it came from Satan, this opening of the ears, this opening of his mouth. This reminds me of how certain people today will lie to the point of denying the obvious power of God. Some people will even lie to the point of denying common sense. But today, in lying about Jesus, they reveal themselves to be the sons of Satan, as Christ literally calls them in John's Gospel. So this is truly an epiphany, a manifestation, an unmasking of darkness, an unmasking of the Pharisees. The Pharisees actually do get something right, though. They do understand there is a hierarchy of demons, and they're implying, to put it in juvenile terms, there is a big demon commanding a little demon. They are claiming Jesus commanded this little demon of deafness to leave because he, can't even really say this on a podcast, God forgive me for repeating such a blasphemy, because he is a big demon, is what they're saying. But really, the Greek here is very personalized. It's referring to real demons, archontiton daimonion, commander of the demons, literally. Let's hear what Father Lapide has to say on this topic. He quotes verse 34. But the Pharisees said, By the prince of the devils, he casteth out devils. The Vulgate has in principem, but the Syrian has by the prince. As among the angels, so also among the devils, some are lower, others higher in rank. The princes, that is, those of the higher orders who fell, were of a nobler nature. For that which was theirs naturally remained in the devils after their fall. Thus, those who fell of the seraphim, the cherubim, and the thrones are princes among those from the lower orders of the dominions, the principalities, and the powers who sank. The latter consequently are princes over those who fell from the inferior order of virtues, archangels, and angels. Thus, even among rebel soldiers, there are standard bearers, captains, and colonels. For without these, an army cannot be marshaled and governed. Moreover, no republic can exist without order and subordination. Lucifer is the prince of all the devils, as St. Michael is of all the angels, as I have said in Apocalypse 12, Daniel 12, and Isaiah 14. He means his commentary on that. Note the different dispositions of the Pharisees and the crowds. The crowds, with artless candor, magnify the miracles of Christ as done by a divine person, even the Messiah. But the Pharisees were envious of Christ considered him unworthy, and said that he was a magician and had a familiar demon, by whose magic art he did these wonderful things, and not by divine power. This was the awful blasphemy which Christ thoroughly refutes in chapter 12, verse 25. But now, courageously and meekly bearing and despising their charges, he proceeds in his course of doing good, and repays and confutes their blasphemies with fresh miracles. Hence, St. John Chrysostom says, 
After being insulted, the Lord offers favors. Okay, so let's just finish with a couple thoughts on the imaginative way of prayer. Hopefully you, those doing the imaginative way of prayer can bring everything I've already taught to this. So just a few thoughts. Remember, as I said earlier, picture this deaf mute coming up to Jesus so taken by this demon that probably his lips are pursed and that jaw might even be clenched. clenched. And think of in the history of the saints, you know, St. Catherine of Siena, they would bring in the 13th century to her those people who had demons who even exorcists could not exercise. Now, St. Catherine of Siena was not allowed to break open the rite, R-I-T-E, to do exorcisms, but just being in her presence was this huge cloud of grace and peace. How much more Jesus Christ himself? So imagine this man with these pursed lips and clenched jaw, just totally controlled by this demon to the point he can't even speak. Just being in the presence of Jesus. We don't even hear words from our Lord. Maybe he said them, but we don't even hear them. Being in the presence of our Lord on this extraordinary day and his ears are opened and he can begin to speak. Look at the freedom and the liberation as you imagine this in your sight, your sound, maybe hearing him speak for the first time. All of this, what an extraordinary day this was. This freedom and liberation, just being in the presence of Christ when he wills your healing. And so the colloquy, this is one of the important things for St. Ignatius of Loyola, is to ask yourself, what would I say? What would I say to our Lord? And then you say this in prayer. So maybe one of the things I would suggest as you are there is, what does Christ have to open your mouth on speech? Maybe it's to speak kinder to people. Maybe it's to excoriate people that you know into the gospel more. Maybe it's to literally thank God verbally more. Maybe it's to sing his praises, literally sing his praises. That's in the Bible. Maybe it is to um, speak the Psalms. Maybe it's to whisper the Psalms and pick up the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Ask our Lord how he has to open your mouth to praise, to admonish, to thank, to speak words of healing, to speak words of forgiveness, whatever, whatever it is. This is the type of thing you bring to prayer. And perhaps times in the past in the imaginative way of prayer, maybe I've made it too much like these are just complaining times or maybe petitionary times. Let's see what the old school way of this was. This is Father Peter who wrote that book on Teresa of Avila. He suggests that our colloquy, that our conversation in a Carmelite manner goes like this. The soul begins to talk slowly to Christ, telling him of its love for him, its desire to serve him, its willingness to do anything for him. He adores Christ in the scene of the day's meditation. He expresses his love for him, thanks him for past gifts, petitions him for new favors in the future. So again, you see this coming probably. You could picture yourself the deaf person whose mouth has just been opened or the deaf person whose ears were opened, the mute who is now able to speak. And tell our Lord of your love for him, your desire to serve him, and now your willingness to do anything for him. Please say an hour, Father, for me. Et benedictio Dei omnipotentis Patris et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, descendet super vos et maniat semper. Amen.